these so these cortical columns, right? Uh, the initial kind of organization is more of these mini columnar, vertically interconnected, you know, kinds of structures. They're smaller. Um, they're actually a consequence of development, where you know, early in development, when the you know cortex is being formed, um, these you know dividing neurons um, actually follow out these glial cells. They're called radial glia. They provide sort of like these glial highways. They they grab on and they pull themselves across and they kind of dump out at the end and form, you know, the vertically interconnected columns. Um, where uh, you know you've got inputs that are going to be arriving from places like thalamus or other areas in neocortex into the fourth layer down, you know, in you know a mini column of neocortex. Um, you're going to see the processing across those six layers, right? The interconnections across the six layers, and then you know uh, axons leaving from the more superficial layers, layers two and three, extending down into the white matter to go to other areas of neocortex and then come in, you know, and synapse at layers, layer four there. Um, and then you have cells in the deeper layers of these mini columns, right, that will, um, you know, send their axons down, you know, primarily to structures like the thalamus, right, or other subcortical targets like the basal ganglia or the hypothalamus. So um, there's a, there's a rep repetitive sort of circuit structure and with experience, actually, some of these mini columns kind of wire up together so that they they respond kind of functionally as a unit, like as a broader unit made up of multiple mini columns. This is sometimes referred to as a kind of a functional column. Uh, it's made up of more than one mini column, like a bunch of them that are all responding to the same stimulus. Um, and so what's interesting is in like sort of primary sensory regions like primary visual cortex, or primary auditory cortex, it's it's pretty clear now to some extent. Like, what are the optimal stimuli that drive, you know, columnar activity? You know, that get a cortical column to respond and you know say, hey, this is it. This sets me off, and you know, start processing it. Um, and it tends to be sort of simple, you know, uh, basic aspects of whatever that particular you know sensory modality happens to be. So, for example, with vision. Um, you know, pr the columns in primary visual cortex are organized based upon, you know, bars of light oriented in specific directions. Um, there's a great deal of like uh, kind of like placement specificity, like these columns in primary visual cortex are monitoring just a very specific region of space. You know, you got to have your eyes sort of fixated here for this particular whatever you're placing a stimulus here. You know that'll actually reach, you know, this column and sort of drive its behavior. We call the the area at least in, we're talking about, for example, the um, the visual world or the visual system. You know, this is the receptive field for those neurons that are localized in this column that are going to be responsive to only whatever optimal stimulus they, you know, have kind of, you know, organized around responding to. Like a bar of light, it's got to be in this orientation. You know, that's its optimal stimulus that'll drive activity in this column, this sort of, you know, functional column. Um, and it's got to be in this very tiny specific receptive field. Uh, in primary auditory cortex, just as another, you know, modality example, um, the columns are organized based upon the frequency, you know, of the sound that is being heard. So um, the, the, the columns, you know, will respond to low frequency here, and then it'll go to higher frequency, higher frequency as you go more posterior. Um, and it's interesting, um, there is a homuncular organization in all these systems, right, where you have far more columns in, you know, primary visual cortex that are responsive to bars of light oriented in particular directions from a very specific part of the visual field, you know, that we call the fovea, you know, the area that we're monitoring you know, with very high resolution, you know, um, uh, you know, photoreceptive, you know, density uh, that we'll talk about. Um, and with, uh, with primary auditory cortex, those columns that are responsive to frequencies of sound, there are far more columns that are responding to frequencies, you know, between the ranges of, let's say, 500 hertz to about five or 6,000 hertz, which are, you know, more the frequencies that are associated with human speech as opposed to very, very high frequency sounds. We have far fewer columns of neocortex that are devoted, 
you know, to responding to the things that sound like a mosquito. We don't have the same discriminative kind of capacity. Um, but what's interesting is that these primary sensory cortices, right, you can sort of tell to some extent, like, what is, you know, the stimulus that will drive each, you know, um, column. What, what is the organizing principle, you know, for the functional organization of columns in these regions? Usually some basic aspect of whatever the modality, you know, happens to be, like bars of light in particular orientations or the frequency of sound. But as you move forward in the brain, uh, you know, when you have projections out of the superficial layers of neocortex and primary visual cortex, right? You know, that'll go, you know, descend down and then go into another area of neocortex, let's say V2 or V3 or V4, you know, work their way to different locations and enter at layer four, and, you know, get distributed across these columns. And, well, it, it's harder sometimes to figure out like what is the functional organizing principle. <laughs> sometimes, you know, we, we have good information. It tends to be more complex optimal stimuli as you move more anterior in the brain, right? Um, uh, more towards the front of the brain, the rostral area of the brain. So as you go along the temporal lobe, for example, from primary visual cortex, the, um, the, the columns there become responsive to, you know, visual objects that are more complex than just a bar of light, you know, in a particular orientation. So as you move along here, there are areas that are involved in, for example, eyes. One column will, you know, basically respond to eyes this far apart. You know, the next column this far apart, then this far apart. It puts, you know, different components together that'll drive, you know, as you go more anterior, um, you know, columns in certain regions in an area called the fusiform, you know, face area, fusiform gyrus that will, you know, put together the components of a face, you know, in a specific, you know, relation there. Uh, you know, if you actually look at the front of a car and you see the headlights and the grill, if, if you look at it a certain way, you can get a, a face impression um, and it will, you know, set off columns in, you know, the fusiform face area in the temporal lobe. Uh, it's part of what we're going to call the visual what pathway along the temporal lobe. And as you go further and further in that temporal lobe, you actually, for example, can um, get columns that recognize specific individuals' faces. Um, so they'll respond only to particular individuals. I and mean, the other thing that's really interesting is um, how the receptive field, you know, uh, that each of these columns in, let's say, this visual what pathway, let's say this um, even more specific, the face processing networks in the frontal lobe, uh, or sorry, in the temporal lobe are involved in. Um, the receptive field, you know, starts off in primary visual cortex, very, very precise, like a bar of light you know, oriented in this specific, that specific direction, it's got to be in this location while I'm looking like this, right? But as you move further, more anterior, and you get to, you know, columns that are putting together more multimodal input, you know, from not just vision, but audition, and, you know, from somatosensation, and from olfaction, all these things that are converging, you know, to drive the activity of these columns. The stimuli are more complex. It'll be like, you know, a face-like stimulus, for example, and then ultimately like a specific individual's face. Well, the receptive field that those columns are monitoring is like at, at, when you finally get to like recognizing your mother or your you know, your spouse or your you know friend or something like that. It is um, you know pretty much the entire visual field that the column is sort of monitoring. So um, primary sensory cort cortices columns are organized by simple sensory principles like bars of light in particular orientations or sounds of particular frequencies in these other more complicated areas of cortex as you move forward they're often referred to as association cortices because they are you know associating more inputs to drive you know the complex you know responses response properties that they'll have uh, you know to stimuli in their environment uh, it's going to be more complex stimuli like faces, for example, that will differentiate and drive columnar activity. And then you get to areas like in the frontal lobe. We know that the frontal lobe is really important for social decision making. But, you know, what are the individual columns? How are they parsing details? Basically, you know, it's going to be sort of complex social aspects of our environments that drive, you know, the functional responses of you know, columnar activity in the frontal lobe. So I just, I hope you're, you're getting a little sense here how this, this sort of network architecture and this columnar organization is actually, 
you know, really powerful. In some ways, um, you know, it, it, it seems like maybe not all that many genetic changes had to occur to get more circuits, to get more, you know, mini columns kind of generated and created. As a, you know, there's, there's a lot of diversity in different regions of cortex, but there is a consistency to the underlying circuitry, you know, that allows it to, you know, take input, you know, kind of distribute it up and down, parse it, process it, and then send outputs to connect with other nodes in these, you know, more distributed networks across the brain. So uh, functionally and structurally and functionally, very, very interesting and obviously critical for, you know, our psychology, uh, you know, portion of our brain.